Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversation. My name is Joe Haverman, and today we he have here Ug Abriel. Um, welcome, Ug. Hello, Joe. Nice to meeting with you today. It's a great pleasure having you here. Um, we met because we ha both have a regional interest in the continent of Africa, um, <laughs> and for the is it a working environment or language group? For me, it's more the Anglophone parts and countries, and probably for you as well, as well as Francophone, French-speaking right. Africa. And we got to know each other through my work with Africa Archive, the African publishing platform, and yeah, and your collaborations with researchers in the Francophone and the French-speaking countries across Africa. Um, yeah, just for a little bit of background, um, maybe you can also say more about yourself, yourself. Um, but you are a biologist and also a physician, um, uh, educated in ETH Zurich and University of Lausanne. You did your PhD in medicine and life sciences, specializing in medical physiology at the University of Lausanne and then since 2009 uh, are or have been and continue to be a professor of molecular medicine at the University of Bern. We also work together through a course, you kindly invited me to give a course so with um, the realms of open science and research project management. Um, so yeah, maybe um, so much for the background. Would you like to add anything else? Um, about your career yeah. trajectory and then how did you yeah if you if you would fill in some gaps and then um, how did you get to work um, on projects together with African colleagues yes. and the work you're doing today yes okay so yes I'm um, you know Switzerland is a country where we speak uh, let's say many languages at least uh, three to four and um, I was born and raised in French-speaking Switzerland Geneva and uh, what I may want to add about my education is uh, that something I learned uh, well more or less recently and that's, I think I think it's important for me also for my motivations it's uh, uh, I'm a first gen I mean I'm, I'm, I'm someone coming from a family who, where uh, no one uh, studied before, uh, no one went to the university, and uh, for whatever reason, so you know, I could I, I could uh, benefit from free public, outstanding education, and um, uh, I, I, it made me clear, you know, how privileged I was to 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 be to was to to be born in in, in Switzerland and to 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 benefit of that, and you know, studying. First uh, at the ETH Zurich, and then at the University of Lausanne, where I got uh, top education. Um, and then <clears throat> I had a very, uh, you know, straightforward academic career. Uh, I, I I worked for a company for seven months. You know, I have my very small uh, experience in, in the so let's call it private industry. It was a startup. And that's where I learned a lot about what I do not want to do. Uh, and I was really happy to be back uh, into academia. Can you spend maybe uh, two or three sentences? What, what did you experience in, in the industry, so to say, on the, or in the free market that, you, that made you go back to academia? Like what were the triggers to where you felt, oh, this is not for me. I want, yeah. I want to go back to what I well, this. This was this was obviously a very specific experience, right? I mean, one cannot generalize, but I I could not identify myself to the project. Uh, this was not my project. This was something you know that was you know uh, the project of the of the company. It was a small, it was a startup company. I thought the project was would be interesting, but actually I could not invest any emotions in this project somehow um, because it was not my project mm -hmm. and and this freedom that I, I could get back or I, I knew that I would get in academia in an academic environment to, to you know to, to think about your own project to draft your project to write it to convince your colleagues that uh, this is something that is worth funding 
Um, so um, I, I could only find it in, in this academic environment. And then there is the other aspect of, of being at a private company where at the end you have to work with a product, you have to, to somehow sell a product. And uh, this is not something that I'm too much interested in, I'm much more um, attracted by the idea of, of as a scientist, uh, creating new knowledge and, and transmitting this new knowledge. Mm. Yeah, I think that makes well that that makes sense. And there's different personalities in the world of research, yes. which is why it makes sense to have these two routes available. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sure that many, many colleagues, researchers, scientists, whoever can be extremely happy uh, in a private company. And, and, and some of them are just saying that they just do not like at, at the academic environment mm -hmm. and the, the rules and the you know, sort, of, sort of competitions or politics of, of academia. Um, for me, that it's was a, never a problem. It's just different pressure points. And maybe it's a way to adapt to either system better or worse. Yeah. Or get along and yeah, and work with the compromises and still see the benefit of the work and the as soon as we're as long as we're able able to to balance and not only work and life but also well being in the job and I think it's also like you said it's if you're more in invested in the process or the the outcome I think that's a personality thing maybe yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, it has to do also with values, right? I mean, I, I have to come back to the fact that private industry, at the end, I mean, um, one of the values that that you know it, it's uh, it's uh, an economic value uh, at the end, uh, I think. And um, yeah. so, um, okay, uh, I and um, it's not always on the top. Obviously, not. I mean, you can do just being, you know, working in research and development uh, in very early phases um, in, um, in let's say, pharma industry. Uh, but still, at the end, I mean, you, you understand that you are working in an environment where you have to sell a product. Hmm. Or, yeah, as yes. long as the value is clear and as long as we can align ourselves with that's a good product to market. Yes, I think that's okay. But once there's yeah. too many compromises, then it comes. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I I see that point too. Yes. Okay. So, um, would you say that being a first generational academic made you also more aware and sensitive to um, the disparities when it comes to global research inequities? Yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, um, obviously, the, when I start to be interested uh, to um, collaborate and work with and go and to travel to African universities, I mean, it started with, with uh, one place. It started with the University of Kinshasa seven, eight years ago. So um, it came quite quickly to my mind that um, the young people that I was, where I was with, working with, or younger, older actually, uh, they were all aspiring um, um, you know, to very, very similar things that I, I was aspiring when I was their age. But for me, it has been easy to, 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 to get to where I am now and where I, I, I can do now. You know? And for them, it, it, it's a, sometimes completely impossible. You know, I, I see how many times how difficult, for instance, it is for um, young um, doctors, young uh, students to get a PhD uh, position somewhere. They have to write motivation letters to hundreds of, of, of places in the so-called Western world, and, and they just do not get any answer, right? Mm. So um, it's as if they would not exist sometimes. And um, this has been very, quite a painful experience for me to, 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 to see this. Mm. And again, it, it has been also clear for me that um, even though no one around me or you know, showed me the, the, the past, 
everything was here here in Switzerland. You know, I go, to, I went to school, uh, I went, and uh, I just followed what I wanted to or wished it to do. Would your did your parents support you or other people in the family? Yes, yes, yes. They were they were quite mm. happy and proud, but uh, nothing special. Mm. <laughs> so. I feel like from what I've heard sometimes in like I have most um, connections and friends and colleagues in Kenya and other places and there at some point it gets more important to get food on the table as to yes. pay yes. for school fees to pursue a yes. career yes. Um, so that might also be a barrier um, okay uh, so then how like when did you get in touch with African or Francophone Africa in particular in the research environment? It was a bit of a coincidence. So, uh, as I said, uh, I went through this sort of pretty easy career of getting interesting positions in academia, professorships, group leaders, and so. And when I turned 50, I, th I thought, um, uh, well, the world is wider than just that, right? I mean, other places <laughs> and um and i never really considered that this would be uh, i mean until then uh interesting I, I never went to africa before really uh and um i asked for advices um a few friends and told them you know i, I have five weeks and maybe you have uh, ideas where i could spend my five next weeks um to do something different and then uh, they they told me well um uh, university of kinshasa may be an interesting place for you uh we have addresses and, and colleagues working there i mean those people were working at the tph tropical health institute uh, university of basel in switzerland mm -hmm. and um I, I landed there and i started to work and teach and, and be in the labs and give seminars and interact with with uh, the colleagues there and um, that's how it started really uh, and this is still quite recent for me uh, and uh, and I, I'm discovering and learning every day about many, many aspects, well, cultural aspects of Africa, you know, the diversity, uh, the cultural diversity of, of the continent. Um, and then, well, more specifically, I'm interested to try to be involved in, in this idea of, um, you know, what, what is the future of academic mysticism in, 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 in these countries? And uh, for me, it was also somehow easier but also more meaningful to, to, to work with uh, colleagues that were speaking, or most of them are speaking, or at least teaching um, by using the French language, mm -hmm. uh, because there is one barrier less somehow mm -hmm. uh, by using the same language. Well, the, uh, that's how it starts, yeah. Were the dialects easy to understand? Mm, well, yes, I mean, I wouldn't say they, they, there is any French either. They, they speak French like they speak French. I mean, okay. there are many so ways to speak French. No, there is. That's not difficult. No, we are. I mean, it's funny because sometimes we are using words that are not completely the same. Mm -hmm. It's also funny because um, uh, there are, well, I mean, those are just uh, anecdotes, but in Congo, they use also something like, uh, you know, uh, instead of saying, well, uh, 70, they say also septante, like, 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 like in Belgium, because they were mm -hmm. colonized by Belgium. So yeah. uh, it brings us a bit together. Well, there are, those are mm. small things. Yeah, tragic, like tragic occurrences in the past, which nowadays um yeah lead to funny coincidences or yes 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 oh you're right i mean um, one can make a long list of, of connections like this yes. <laughs> yes that's correct but also i feel it's my experience is also in some countries in africa have a harder burden with the colonial past than others i feel the kenyans were more of the kind who eat like more easily, I wouldn't say it was easy for them, but more mm -hmm. easily embraced English as a trading mm -hmm. language and see the opportunities and having been mm -hmm. forced in the past to learn the language, but not make it, make use of it for their own benefits and mm -hmm. cultivating mm -hmm. English as a trading and business language. Mm -hmm. 
whereas I feel, um, <coughs> I think in some West African and Anglophone countries, they have a hard time and they feel more, no, we need to learn our own languages again and foster these because mm -hmm. colonial heritage and we need to decolonize. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is somewhere in between yeah um because yeah. cultural yeah. identity through language is also important but but why yeah but at, at the same time you can also embrace and take for given what's there today acknowledge the past and then see how how we can all make the best of it of, of the situation that we yes uh, uh, well it's i mean i was very surprised i mean i've seen that in other maybe countries or so, i'm not sure but but and at least I've seen that in Kinshasa, but then I saw also that in Morocco. I mean, how, you know, in one sentence you use at least, or you can easily use uh, two, three different languages. And that's mm -hmm. not only when you speak, you know, on the, on the street with, with a friend, but also when you listen to radio. I mean, they, they, they are, I mean, Kinshasa, they speak mainly Lingala, but half of the sentence is in Lingala and the other half is in French. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's a very <laughs> pragmatic use of language. I, I like that very much. Mm. Uh, yes. And in Northern Africa, we have a mix of Arabic, French, and then some of the local languages. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in Morocco, I was, I was surprised, I have to say, that um, French, and maybe it has to do with what you just mentioned, uh, is um, at least in, in the younger generation uh, is not the first um, foreign language. I mean, they, they they really would like to speak or they speak better. Many of them would speak better English than French. Um, and um, yeah, I was not expecting that, but I think, well, that's their, their right to do so. And it's, I understand that they want to do that, so. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, like, you know, when we, and, and I know that you are work, you are working a lot on, on these indigenous languages, and I think it's very interesting mm. topic. Um, the idea of, of, of having diversity in, in community, communicating science in, in languages, I think this is, a, this is an interesting topic. And not only, you know, you can speak see it with, with indigenous languages, but at least the, the, one, of, one of my issues is the, 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 the predominance of English uh, at this stage. And uh, the fact that we can use other languages to communicate science, I think it's super important. Mm. Um, yeah, um, like one of the projects we're working now on with Africa Archive is called Decolonial Science. Um, and the idea is like mm -hmm. originally we wanted to translate 180 submissions that came into Africa archive into like also authored primarily by African researchers um, and translate those into six uh, underrepresented, so to say, native languages, African yep. traditional languages. Yep. Um, then we pretty much figured that all oh, the translators, these are professional translators and interpreters, um, they figured there's way too many specific like research topic specific terms, which mm -hmm. do not exist in the local mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and we as anticipated anyways yeah. to build a glossary of new terms. And we, there was, there was already not by us, by Epic Archive, but our partners from Masakana, which is a continent-wide machine translation for African languages um, organization. Okay. And uh, so, so the idea is to translate, and well, and then we figured there's too many specific terms. Okay. So now the approach we're taking is we're preparing lay summaries um, through. A, a part, another partner company that's called Sci, Sci, Science Link. They're both South African based. And the lay summary then will be translated to the local languages. And that's a much more pragmatic approach. And there's still a lot of new terms to coin sure. or words to create um, out of 
out of um, yeah the, the the terms that are already exist in the language, but then to create new yeah. terms for a scientific context, and that's yeah. across all the disciplines. So it's quite an effort to actually translate research from your. So you, for instance, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, one technical term I use every day, I mean, electrocardiogram. Uh -huh. uh, so there would be a way to 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 have it expressed in like 10, 20 different local languages. Yeah, That's for us it's six. So we limit ourselves to six, which is still quite ambitious. Six, um, yeah. But so then the translators would look into the the language, whatever is um, like they're also native speakers of the, the languages they translate into. So if the yeah. word electricity and heart already exist and we compose a word right. and if there's no word for electricity then it's maybe current like from water okay right? okay or okay. in some cases like in german we also have english or latin terms for science yes 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 whatever. Yeah, so yeah, then yeah, yeah in yeah. some cases we just remain with the latin or english original yeah yeah. Um, but the idea yeah. is to have it comprehensible also for for lay audience, and to yeah, and also to build a scientific fit language to make the local languages fit for science discourse. Because now is the question from your experience in medical research. Like I often say, to argue for multilingualism in research, irrespective of the discipline. I would argue, maybe naively so, that most research is culturally embedded. Meaning, if you translate it to a foreign language, you lose information. Would you say that you've experienced that in medical research in some cases as well? Yes, yes. Um, I'm not an expert, but I think it's, you know, I understand that uh, concept that you, you just mentioned. But the first, I mean, the, the, the most obvious, I think the most obvious field in medicine where I would see this applying is um, mental health and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you define, or how do uh, how do you study psychosis, you know, hallucination in a uh, in a population where, you know, having visions is something that is much more normal in the culture. Mm. Uh, while, I mean, if now I tell you, uh, you know, I'm looking at, at, at the window here and I see uh, a giraffe, so you will tell me, well, you know, there is a problem with me. Uh, when, 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 when someone is saying that in Kinshasa, when he or she is saying, well, I'm seeing a uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> strange a animal. giraffe with a very short neck, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they would say, well, that's okay. <laughs> but it, oh. it's, it's magic. Uh, and they, they accept that. No, well, but I'm sure that, you know, you, you may have hundreds and thousands of, you know, Every, every, I mean, I mean, what you're saying is that it applies most likely everywhere. Mm. Uh, and uh, yes, it's about you know anthropology and, and science, and uh, and yes, the language here plays a role, obviously. Yeah, but like in Switzerland, you speak French, English, Italian, then some dialects, mm -hmm. German, German, German. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it depends where you live, what's the common language on the street and then the shops, right? Uh, anyways. So does it mean you mm -hmm. have like various news channels for each language? Like are all languages equally served across the country? Well, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question right now. I mean, obviously, you know, news channels are in three to four different languages and uh, well, for, for instance, for me, I'm living in the, in, in, in the French part, but I'm working the German part. And in order for me to be uh, some in tune with, with the German part of the country, I, I, I sort of force myself to, to look at the German news. 
Mm-hmm. Swiss German, yes. So you can also live in a bubble with your own language in, in yes. the same country. Yes, yes. And you yes. decide not to to be international. Well, no, uh, it would not be good for me. I mean, mm-hmm. I would miss. I mean, I know that I need to have this um, also diversity of, of inputs. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this might seem a bit off topic, but in the sense I'm trying to learn. Is that an approach we can also apply to research? Because you're originally Francophone yourself, or Mm -hmm. French, Mm -hmm. French, right? Yeah. So your working environment is English, is that so? Yes, yes, English and German. German? Yes, yes. I mean, in the lab, in in, in the research group, we we work work in English, but then the rest is in German, high German. And you publish in English primarily, or also in French? Yes, yes, yes. No. On English. And the Congolese colleague and those in Morocco, would they publish rather in French journals, French speaking journals, or in English? I mean, if it, they would have the choice, and if they think, you know, that they could get they could get the same visibility and same, yes, they would uh, rather write in English, or oh, in French, sorry, for, for my Congolese colleagues. But the other, I mean, in Morocco, they would, Morocco, they would, I think, write in Arabic. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So from your viewpoint, would you say there's one lingua franca in research or several? How do you see it? Uh, you at, see? at this stage, I think there is one. And, and that's that's one of the, yes. I don't, I mean, well, you know, in, 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 in my, you know, for me, it's different in the sense that I'm quite, comfortable in many of these languages mm. but uh in general there's just, this is a pity that, that there is only one i mean we, or is i have it- to say that's interesting because I, i've been also in, interacting with with russian colleagues in the past mm-hmm. uh, 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 and uh you know before 89 1989 before you know when there was still a war uh, across Europe, so there was a big, big, big uh, Russian bubble. I think you know my 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 friend in in Russia. They were just all publishing in Russian, and they do that still a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, there is a there there is a, as you may know, I mean very well. There is a corpus of of knowledge mm-hmm. that is still not. <laughs> sort of translated uh, from from there. Mm. Yeah, and then it's Mandarin, Portuguese, Spanish, as many yeah. big language groups, French, Arabic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's probably just a perception that we have that English is the only lingua franca. There's probably several. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. That's maybe our Western perception that that, that is, is the case, yes, because we have we 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 somehow had to adapt to that mm. uh, because we had the incentives. I mean, we were also evaluated by the fact that we were able to, 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 to speak, to give a seminar in English, to, to write correct English. You're right. Yes, that's correct. And it could also be that biosciences are heavily English speaking just because it's industry driven so much nowadays. Yes, yes. It's maybe true that humanities, uh, uh, it's different. You're right. Yeah, I'm also a biologist, so I'm I, I'm just discovering these things since recently <laughs> to to open up my viewpoint or changing perspective and trying to understand a bigger picture which wasn't available, accessible to me naturally. But so again for your Congolese colleagues, they would there's a language barrier. So they would prefer yes. French journals and then yes. Yes, yes, French yes, journals yes. in France for the international exposure so that they can have exchange with their well and... the the international exposure I, I don't think that they are you know particularly attracted to, to France I mean they, they the history their own history is Belgium for for Congo mm. uh, and um, they are still there is still a lot of connections I mean from my side <laughs> too many. So I'm not sure that my colleagues will be happy with that, but um, uh, the that's how it is. That's the reference. Uh, I mean, for instance, you know, the whole 
academic environment and uh, academic working is still it's very very based on, on the how it works in Belgium or how it worked in the past in Belgium and this is something that I, I find it extremely interesting you know how much we um, we uh, how much the, 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 the African universities have been trying to adapt or mimic the Western types of universities. And I, I'm quite convinced that there, there would be, there are many more options to, 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 uh, to, to learn about new things and to transmit new knowledge. Mm. Um, and it's also a chapter we're slowly digging into. And thankfully also with open science and the recently yes. announced recommendations by UNESCO for no the UNESCO open science recommendations. Mm -hmm. They also expl explicitly mention indigenous knowledge and non-academic yeah. knowledge systems to be inclusive of open science. And I personally also believe, I mean, a lot of pharmaceutical and medical research goes into traditional and indigenous customs and, and yeah, knowledge. Um, there has been and continue, continues to be, I don't know what, what we might label as exploitative research or helicopter science, where the providers of the knowledge of medicinal plants never see any benefits from the commercialization of the products. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's also, so that's that's something I'm personally also passionate about. How can we get indigenous knowledge acknowledged in the academic system and let indigenous communities participate on, like to avoid um, misappropriation of their knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so it mm -hmm, becomes mm -hmm. a benefit and sharing also for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but there's many dimensions. I think many organizations and projects are also trying to work out approaches that can work for everyone. And that's certainly something I'm interested in looking into. Is, is there any projects you've come across in Congo or Morocco in that direction? Any? Yes, yes, um, a little bit. Yes, I've been um, working. I mean, when I, I've been traveling once in, in, in the center of the country, Congo, um, they um they, i've been in contact with a very small university uh, uh, in kananga which is very much in the center and uh, there they were uh, using you know plants uh and and, and, and mixtures of plants that uh, would extract to treat um sickle cell anemia which is the mm -hmm one of the genetic diseases that is killing a lot a lot of of of, of, of kids there uh, many many of them and um i've been interested about because they, they they asked me well to 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 whether i could support uh, somehow the project um it's extremely interesting because <laughs> as you mentioned there are many components to it right uh one you know the first being tr uh, trained in, in, in our, you know, uh, with our scientific approach. Uh, so we, we know how we would uh, address most of these uh, questions. And uh, one, the first thing that comes to my mind, you know, what, what are the molecules in these plants, right, that are active? And they are mostly, uh, it's, they are, mostly there are the, those molecules there that have a, a you know, a pharmacological activity. And we know that, I mean, about 60 or even more persons of, of the drug that are on markets, they have plant origins somehow in, in the molecules. So there is still a, a, a good uh, chances that we will find many more of them. Yeah. Um, and for them, it's a bit less important uh, at this stage, even though some of them are very well trained, also chemists or are doctors and they really also would like to know but at this stage for them it's just to sh to prove that it, it works and to also to to have their population to be treated with mm. with, with these plants um 
and uh, it was extremely interesting interesting because they 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 they, they now have a, a a preparation they have a, you know a product and 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 they they they, they produce it it's like a, in fact, an extract of these plants that the, 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 the population or the, the, the patients have to, 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 to drink. And I was very surprised because they, you know, they put this in, 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 a, in a small plastic bottle with a red cap and it's looking like you know, very Western things. So, uh, but somehow it, it, it was important for them to, to, to have this um, uh, production and the, 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 these sort of containers. Um, it is, it, you mentioned that, I mean, there are many, many, many components to it. Uh, and one aspect now, I mean, for me, it's just, I mean, there is something, I mean, it looks like that, you know, they, they have been doing studies and it, it seems that their patients are doing better and uh, one has to, to, to be able to, 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 to have a, a scientific sound approach to try to understand what are the, the, the molecular mechanisms underlying what they observe. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's also mechanisms now through open science to acknowledge contribution, even if now, like by, by the researchers who, who have made these observations, but not, might not necessarily have the means to perform the experiments, the molecular mm -hmm. work, because of yeah. infrastructure yeah. training. Yeah. No. Again, for no. it's not because they wouldn't know there. I mean, every human being around the world, I think we can all agree, has the same uh, genetic predisposition to develop wisdom or knowledge. It's just a matter of how much access does each of us have to training and equipment to actually perform to our highest capabilities. Um, but now with the credit taxonomy, and we put um, all the references mentioned um, in the show notes on the blog post. Um, credit taxonomy. Find... Oh, I, I, it's the first time I, I hear this. I, I think I understand what it means, but yeah, I've never yeah. seen. So it's basically when you publish a research article, there's yeah. this authorship list, which is mm -hmm. per discipline has very awkward sometimes roles and positioning of who yeah. has what position in the order of authors mentioned. Mm -hmm. But now the credit taxonomy um, was developed to, to specify what contribution each author or contributor made. And that can also, to also acknowledge data analysts, which not, not naturally per, per research topic or per discipline would be acknowledged with a co-authorship. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But now <clears throat> the argument with credit taxonomy is that everybody who even remotely contributed to uh, the success of research, which then brought about results, which can then be published, should be mentioned as a contributor. And the taxonomy allows us to specify. So who was the, who developed the, the manuscript? Like who did the, mm -hmm. you know, the conceptualization? Mm -hmm. um, who designed the experiments? Who performed the experiments? Who mm -hmm. made? made the data analysis and that can also give credit to early career researchers like undergraduate students who help with the data analysis or observations and now when it comes to north-south collaborations um geographically speaking like uh, between a swiss and a congolese um, researcher and the researcher says look here's how we treat our patients and as we're working in a medical research institute and we don't have the research equipment to study the molecular basis of the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but yet these people, and probably not only the professor, but then several thereof would be mentioned in whatever research study comes out, even if it was performed in Bern University. Because they only, like they made the original observation that there's a treatment in this mm -hmm. plant, which actually mm -hmm. works to treat this mm -hmm. disease. They just mm -hmm. didn't know how it works, which also with many modern drugs, we don't really know how it works, but some few people get a lot of credit for, yeah. for what they describe in writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that I think would also eventually help to bring more funding into the region because the credit is there, the wisdom is proof, like the knowledge is kind of a timestamp and 
it's it's documented that these people mm -hmm. contributed to mm -hmm. and how. Mm -hmm. So that would make it easier for funders to invest in the right research institutions and the right people working at these institutions to, yeah, to, to support the research in the region, not only to foster continuation of exporting the molecular work because of the lack of funding. So I, I think I'm jumping ahead, but in, in the preparation to this recording, you mentioned that you want to point out um, the difficulties that you've discovered, and we kind of talked about that a little bit, but like if you could mention three or five um, hindrances for scholarly research in, in the in DRC, like in Congo, with mm -hmm. that your colleagues there experience on a daily basis that Mm -hmm. surprised you or even shocked you and was like why does it have to be that way and mm -hmm. then we can maybe talk about how, what can we do and maybe mm -hmm. contribution acknowledgement could be one small step in the right direction it's mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. and there's many more mm -hmm. would you mm -hmm. like to um dive in? well spontaneously and what i i i noticed is i think the way science as a community or works it's a lot about uh, networks and, and, and you know what place do you have in this network and how visible you are in this network uh, that's what i i think i you learn as a young scientist in this western world and um, it struck me how difficult uh, it was for a scientist young and older to get any visibility uh, in a community in our community they have their own networks obviously um, but it's quite limited it's quite let's call it maybe inbred but somehow it's very difficult for them to 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 to, to get um seen uh, outside there are exceptions and actually they are you know big in the sense of uh, very successful exceptions i mean in kinshasa um there are two or three professors uh who have been able to publish in the you know the best uh, medical journals um based on research that has been done on specific diseases there uh with 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 uh, funding coming from from abroad and i most of the time uh, the us so that's for me, but but for the vast 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 majority, and, and uh, it, for mainly for for the younger ones, um, they it's quite quasi impossible to to say, well, I'm here, I'm doing science, or I want to do uh, contribute to to, to some, you know something good uh, in in this community because I I, I can't do this. I mean, I'm a smart uh, person, and I can do that, and. Uh, and it makes me very sad that it's not possible that for them. Then obviously the the fact you know that the the infrastructures locally it's uh, most of the time at least in in Congo not very well developed. I mean there is very little access to to to, to modern infrastructure. There is Congo almost zero support from the government, and indeed I mean this is something that. Uh, I, I, I thought, I still think that I could try to contribute to say, well, um, if um, you want to do, I mean, you as a government want to do something good for education. I mean, okay, obviously you have to start with um, all levels of education, but uh, if you're interested about higher educations and research, uh, fund them. I mean, the money is there, <laughs> clearly. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rich country, <laughs> Congo. and. Uh, Morocco, for instance, also is very rich. I mean, they are a bit doing better in that sense. Uh, they they are able to to fund their own project and, and research institutes. Uh, Congo doesn't do that. I mean, and uh, that's that's another aspect to it. Uh, I, I mentioned also the the the, the these, um, and it has to do with with the first visibility aspect. The fact that we language 
is 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 difficult. Logistics traveling is difficult. I mean, you know, if you want if you want to go to Congo now, you still have to have a visa, right? I mean, it takes you uh, a month, and you have to have an invitation letter to uh, to go there, uh, and it, it makes that in fact when you are on the campus of, of this huge university of, of Kinshasa, um, you are one of the uh, only uh, foreigners there. I mean, because uh, it, 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 it is a bit of a, 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 a closed uh, academic environment. And that, that's something that, uh, I mean, um, it's, that it's, you know, doesn't work well if you would be if you want to to progress in in, in science. Um, and um, some of my colleagues there, I mean, now that the new rector of of the University of Kinshasa, uh, he have been working a bit with him. He's a he, he's a pneumologist, and he's very well aware that this is a big big issue. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I think. This is something I also would like to try to contribute uh, in the future. Mm. What did you discuss with them how you can meaningfully contribute and kind of help to ease the burdens or the like lift the barriers a little bit or yeah. a meaningful approach we could we could take in establishing partnerships with researchers in Congo, Kenya, yeah, yeah, yeah. Namibia. Yes, I mean, I think there are a lot of meaningful, I mean, meaningful is a good word. I mean, obviously, but, uh, the, the, the other uh, way to describe it is uh, efficiency. I mean, how, how can you, or, or would be efficiency? And, uh, and I, in fact, I'm not sure that, that uh, I can do, I can really be efficient at the higher level. I, I'm, now it's a bit different, you know, I'm in a position where I can, uh, most likely guide, influence uh, project at a higher level. Um, uh, currently, I'm at the University of Bern, we are part of uh, a, associations or uh, of different university in Europe. It's called the Guild of European Universities. And um, there is really an idea or a possibility, a project to, to, to interact with African universities so that we can, for instance, help to create so-called clusters of excellence in different uh, African universities. So that would be meaningful at a higher level with, with big funding. And uh, mm. I'm looking forward to, to, to be able to contribute at, at that level. But in fact, at, at the end, I mean, I'm more interested to, to have small contributions with, with you know, direct colleagues and, and, and again, younger or uh, more senior colleagues. And one, my way, one of my ways to do it is just to, you know, to be with them uh, in constant contact. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm spending um, sometimes my weekends and my nights uh, to be in co WhatsApp conversations with them and trying to say, oh, uh, have you seen this funding opportunity? Have you seen uh, these uh, PhD position there? I mean, I'll try to help you to, to, to write a motivation letter. I will write a support letter. And um, it's uh, that's where I, I find uh, at this stage still a lot of reward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also direct support is very much efficient so you directly see in, the in, in the that sense of. yes um but this is still i mean i mean it can be seen as a as a small thing right i mean if once want to be i mean let's call it ambitious in the sense that you want mm -hmm. to see it big uh that's not it but this is big and ambitious for that person somehow yeah you know? and, and that that's that's, that's might... maybe enough yeah, and that person might then be able to grow into a position yes. to have a bigger impact on other people. Yes, yes. So yeah. that might cause a ripple effect. Um, when it comes to funding, there's many funding opportunities and they're all scattered all around. 
Yes. Um, I just want to mention there's something in the making, like funding opportunities for African researchers um, okay. by a friend and colleague of mine. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of probably weeks or months. And uh, hopefully this year we'll be able to release it. So I will certainly let you know once the good yeah once once there is a kind of yeah. more central uh database a central point to yeah to to curate many of the available funding opportunities it's similar how research output how research um that's what i discovered with africa archive that like our mission is to make african research output discoverable because mm -hmm. what you hear often from different publishers and different um, also from our own experience and what how much visibility African research has is very little. Same with Eastern Europe um, or other mm -hmm. underrepresented and underfunded um, research communities. Mm -hmm. And our argument is it's not true. Like much of the research is still in print. There's the continent is multilingual, not only four major language groups, but like hundreds of languages and thousands, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also within the Western um, scholarly system and literature discovery systems, there's so many silos. So, even for one person in the UK or in Switzerland or Germany, like us, like to find literature that's relevant and related to our work, we would have to, well, most researchers rely, rely on one or two sources, but there's so many, so much more to explore if you only mm -hmm. know where to check. And mm -hmm. yeah, so why am I saying this? Same with funding opportunities. So I think there's a need to yes keep things decentralized in a way to for to allow for. I'm also a biologist and um, mm -hmm. evolutionary focus mm -hmm. biologist mm -hmm. training so i love diversity mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and i think diversity has a lot of meaning in many aspects of life that's, yeah. that's so there yeah. at the same time it makes sense to have like few access points for information and resources and not to diversify in such a way that I mean, nature normally, if intact, creates abundance for everyone. Mm -hmm. It only becomes difficult to manage when there is scarcity, which is nowadays caused by us humans. Okay, this is becoming mm -hmm. philosoph philosophical or even political mm -hmm. now. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is, similar to where we started the conversation, even with, with lingua franca presumably being English, mm -hmm. And yet there's so much more research in other languages. How can we make that count into what we consider as modern research if we don't see it and we don't make an effort to even realize or how, I mean, how would we make an effort if we didn't know there's more out there to discover? And once being aware of it, what can we do to get, gain access, meaning learning the languages or finding ways to translate? And for research funding, it's also a matter of being aware, knowing where to look. Like you said, you're pointing your colleagues to funding opportunities, which might not be easily on their radar because they live in a different um, mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. or a different mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. where checking for online opportunities for funding is not the, not necessarily the everyday um, mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm yeah i would have a question for you yes please <laughs> so um no because you know you you introduce or you work with many new concepts of doing things that we think are going to be better for our communities and, and colleagues well that's that's our hope mm -hmm. uh the 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 issue or the concern i have is how do we implement them how do we spread them in our communities uh, because we are in a somehow extremely conservative i mean you as a biologist evolution of a biologist ecologist so you 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 see also the analogies so uh why is an idea or a concept or something let's say let's take the concrete example that you just mentioned predict taxonomy right i mean this idea is here since 
I think many years mm. I mean, now maybe it's formulated in a way that uh, you know there are not interesting tools but still uh, maybe one or mill in our academic environment they would understand and you think that uh, well we can apply it or we should apply it so how can we more easily introduce some of these ideas or is just because they are intrinsically so good mm. they would prevail one day and that we have to first, you know, to put them on the table or and just present them and apply them for ourselves, and then maybe they are so good that everyone will apply them. Uh, yeah, I see. I've also struggled for many years with the concept of open science because it's now a new term, new rules apply, new things to learn, and that's always change is always difficult because it needs, like, if we look at physics, it needs an impulse energy which we don't feel we have because we're already overwhelmed with the things that are going on. Um, and there's so much pressure in the system. But what, like the way I now approach open science or what is now commonly referred to as open science is just, it's just good scientific practice. It's like when, like what does it matter to publish in an impactful journal or whatever the journal claim has a high impact factor where all they measure is the citation rate within their own journal, the same journal from the previous year. I don't know. Like it's a weird measure and it was not meant to be a quality, it cannot be a quality measure, but it's, it's perceived as if. So we look at the impact factor and then many of the high impact factor journals are either very expensive to publish in open access or they're closed access. So there's a paywall and whoever wants to read has to pay. And maybe not if you happen to work at a university who's already paid a lot of money for the access. And if you happen to, to be a researcher in Congo, then your university might not have had the means to pay for that access. So then you can never read that article. And what's the point in publishing research results that can never see the... So that's the way I approach it. I mean, not so... Like, I, I actually approach it in... Yeah, reminding us of why did we come, become a researcher as we want to disseminate, accumulate and then disseminate knowledge for whatever is considered the greater good or to cure a disease. How can we do our part of the work to cure a disease? We understand the mechanism that cause the disease or that bring about a cure. And then we publish that and then we I think it's also the researcher's responsibility to make sure to publish in a journal that provides access to the target audience. And then for us also, who is my target audience? Is it policymakers? Is it the industry, pharmaceutical industry? Is it the patients? Maybe all of them to varying degrees. But then I think like we said in the beginning, there's different types of humans and Amongst researchers, I found there's specialists and generalists. And the generalists are more likely to see the bigger picture and also have a, an urge to want to have a purpose and also a knowledge transfer with the work that we do. And the specialists are more interested in the process and they want to understand and then accumulate the knowledge. And then the rest is not so much their interest and that's okay. So then for me as a trainer and consultant, the question is what type of researcher are you and how can I help you in, yeah, and so ensuring that or helping you to secure your career to, to be able to continue research in whatever way you want. And also for this research output to go to the next stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is where, yeah, this is, I think, where I want to see myself in the profession that I know mm -hmm. goes for mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. like not being an active researcher anymore, or more mm -hmm. on the meta level, I still publish research articles, but more mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. infrastructure and due to the work that we do with Africa Archive um, and research data or yeah, databases and analysis but um, not in the bioscience 
um, where I came from. And also I miss it like very much, but I'm not so much a process oriented person. I'm more for conceptualizing and then analyzing results to conduct the experiments was never my favorite game and research. That's why I think it was also easy for me to leave. But I still miss, like you said, like I miss academia. I miss the, whatever is considered the research freedom or what we, think it would be if there wasn't so much pressure <laughs> but but yeah the liberty to be able to come up with research questions and then dig in and try to interrogate i think there's more yeah surely more freedom in that respect as compared to the industry research because there's a clear goal we need to develop this product how can we get there yeah um so yeah i don't know if i answered your question because i yes i, I mean to also answer it to myself like I, it yeah. wasn't no, but I came, I, 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 someone also come to the same conclusion that by itself, if this is so good, because this is good practice, uh, it has to come a, 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 as a way that we do things, uh, you know, uh, again, as you said, I mean, you use the, 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 the examples of the impact factors and a, a, any smart person, or you don't have to be very smart, but to try to understand this is, this is completely bullshit to think that the quality of what you publish depends on the impact factor of the journal. But that we are still- That's prestige. And that's, a, that's so yeah. sad that, I don't know what people, I think it's a human trait that people are so, like not all of us, but many of us are prestige oriented. We want yes, to... that that's why I, I it came I came exactly to the to that point when you were saying, well, there are two types of scientists, you know, the, the generalist and and the, and the specialist. I would say at the same time, I I, I see another one mm. the distinctions: the egoist and the altruist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's not very nice uh, for many of our colleagues. Uh, that are, you know, still thinking that it's more about themselves than, you know, than the value of contributing to your community. Yeah, I think, and I think many people, like I like Herman Hesse as an author, and he would argue it's more religiously oriented, but it's the same. I think we all have the traits in us, all of these. It's just the question, but there's also the spiritual saying, depends on which wolf you feed. Like they all live inside us. And it's a matter of being aware and then considering which one to foster, which of these traits and what's more important. What are, what are our values? What are my values? And the value system that I would mention is probably different from yours. And yet we're both community oriented. Um, and I think for the, maybe for the egoists, I wouldn't say they are necessarily bad people. I think they're no. more security oriented for them security is a value and they want to maybe provide for their families or maybe they're selfless in other ways. And then prestige is a way to have wealth and security. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help because <laughs> the effect is still the same. We're trapped in a prestige oriented system currently. Oh, interesting. But I think at the end of the day, the question is, why did you become a researcher? And it might well be that, well, my parents were researchers, so there was no question asked that I would also become an academic. And of course, a medical surgeon, because that's where you earn most money. The other option was to study law <laughs> and it's for the money. And yeah, if, if, if that's what you want in life, then I guess that's okay. The question is how much suffering can you tolerate along the way? Like how, where do you see, where do we see our responsibilities and our impact? So I think the question with impact factor can also be coined in other ways. Like what's the societal impact of our research outcomes? And wouldn't that matter most? And how can we measure it? Like what's a better measure for impact mm -hmm. of society? Mm -hmm. And is that mm -hmm. even measurable? Because much, research only materializes into any positive impact in medicine or other disciplines. 
many years and sometimes decades later yes that's that's why it's it's impossible i mean i think uh you know that's that's the the credo of of basic science just Mm -hmm. fund it because you want to be curious and you want to to create new knowledge and the impact is is most of the time a wrong question at this stage yeah and i think also the question maybe shouldn't be asked because i think in germany we learned the hard way that basic research is what drives economies I think Germany got back on its feet after the war because heavy investments, and that's also lacking in the African region by the Americans and the other allies. But, and then also basic, like lots of basic research, which then uh, fostered all the sectors in the society because that's what drives economies, isn't it? I don't know. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, this, this is something that um, is somehow thought it is like this. I mean, I think it's a bit more complex than this, though. Yeah. Uh, but what, I, what we observed, I, no, in Africa, just, just to finish this thought, and then yeah. I'll be quiet for a moment, <laughs> because there's hardly any basic research across the continent from what I've seen, mm-hmm. uh, for sure mm-hmm. in sub-Saharan Africa. And then the mm-hmm. argument is, yeah, we need more applied research. But what does it have? The funding is mostly and almost only available for Western and geosupplied supplied research, what Western donors think Africans should study. Or they study and let Africans participate because they don't have the means to do that themselves. Mm-hmm. Or I mean, it's a weird... But if you... But if... if African researchers could decide what they want to study, it would surely be a lot of like docking on to indigenous knowledge because the knowledge is already there. And then to bring that into academia from an African approach and an African perspective, I think would certainly serve African economies better because that's also an ownership uh, question. Yeah, yeah. Even though well, I, I, I'm, the way I've seen it, or I interpret it sometimes by, by interacting with, with, with my colleagues, is that, you know, the, the, the curiosity about the basic working of the world uh, and, and the basic questions that you may have, they, we all have the same, mm. is obviously culturally uh, somehow influenced because it depends on your environment for sure. But um, the basic laws of physics and physiology and, 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 the, or, and the complexity of the human body is, is about the same. And um, many, many of, 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 of these colleagues, uh, they are just as in- curious as we are. And they, if we, they would have the, the, the funding that we have, they would just ask most likely the same question we have, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, um, sure. uh, So, and this is, and this is why I early learned, I mean, not to impose any question from my side or, or you know, you cannot, as you mentioned, you know, you cannot say, well, because I, I come with, a, with maybe funding or money, I, I say, well, you have to <laughs> to study this because this is going to be good for you. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is so disrespectful for for our colleague scientists to impose what they have. They <laughs> what yeah. is their own curiosity? At the same time, like you said in the beginning, they have their own observations, which helps their people, and then they're being said to study yeah. molecules yeah. and substances yeah. that come from yeah, the yeah. rest work for us took decades to develop and now they're just being exported into the other region where they might have like there's also the saying for every disease there's a plant um like a herbal medicine Mm -hmm. uh, cure it but these are very region specific so for the african Mm -hmm. or what we commonly refer to as tropical diseases i mean they also exist in other global south regions um there's surely a cure that's locally bred, like local herbs, regional herbs. Mm-hmm. 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 And how, like, wouldn't they know best where to start doing the research? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, sure, I agree. Yes. <sighs> yeah. So okay. Um, but okay, to to maybe close on a positive scenario. Now that we talked a lot about, well, we also I think it was also not only negative talk or talking mm -hmm. about the challenges a little bit. Yes, and the dis disparities exist, and we acknowledge history happened. The approach we often take with Africa archive, and I see that also reflected in the way you argue. Let's let's look for it. Like, what can we do today? Let's foster collaborations. Like, see what we can learn from each other. How can we move on from here? History happened. We cannot turn back the wheel of time. Sure not. But like, so yeah. So basically, what's what's your plan moving forward? Are you going back to? To Africa, <laughs> going back. Yes, to yes, 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 yes. Well, my plan. I mean, I've you no. Know, I started you know concrete collaborations with with both universities, uh, Kinshasa and Fez, and uh, currently um, I have a, uh, a, a first student from the University of Fez who is working in a lab um, in uh, Bern. Uh, she started a few a few days ago, and the idea is to to get enough funding so that these collaborations uh, could continue. But at, at a higher level, so uh, I mean, I don't want to brag, but now, you know, I'm since, since uh, the, the early January, I'm, I'm the vice rector for research here at the University of Bern. And it gives me uh, a, a bit more power to, 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 to do things at, at the higher level. Uh, and um, there is a opportunity or possibilities. And it's clear that the EU, the Europe sees now that, um, <clears throat> there is a need, a potential uh, to do something different with um, the African continent, uh, work more as partners, you know, uh, say, you know, what is your need? What are our needs? Where can I win? Where mm -hmm. could you win if we work together on something? Uh, and obviously funding, big funding is important. And this idea to maybe help create clusters of excellence on the African uh, continent for, for scientists, for researchers, for specific questions. And for me, the questions, the, 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 the two um, uh, questions I, I would be the most interested in, in contributing to is uh, um, genomics in medicine and rare disease in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if um, we could move forward to have uh, something like this work, working on the continent. Uh, both are already, you know, quite well advanced. They have, they have groups in South Africa, in North Africa, also a few groups in, in, in Rwanda, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, I'm sure, uh, working on these things. And the in idea Ghana would be, also, I heard. I yeah, heard yeah. An acquaintance in Ghana who's running a bioscience genetics lab. Yes, yes, yes. And there is also private. Uh, so uh, in Nigeria, there is a company, you know, a genomics company that we, I think they call, they are called 54. It's not 23 and me, but I think it's more like, like 54 and me. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, well, they do next generation sequencing. And um, there is, there is a momentum. There is uh, there, there is a lot to be done on on, on those topics there, and, and, and that's that's uh, where I'd like to to be able to 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 contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is yeah, it's it's great to hear, and um, also that there's, there's concrete plans ahead in fostering these excellence clusters or research um, discipline specific clusters, um, which. I think in the part, some of which existed, there used to be a chemistry association, which yeah can certainly be revived. Um, yeah. And I think also what we see in Europe working well in the United States and or in North America generally, I think also in Latin America, to foster these research communities to enable intracontinental and also international like intercontinental collaborations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's also what we um with africa archive have started to showcase the opportunities that exist for african researchers to network to engage and and globally inclusive um collaboration activities and 
so yeah, happy to, to stay in touch on these um, advancements. And, and I'm sure we we'll hear more from each other. And also, also we should also mention the podcast that you um, produced with your colleagues in both countries um, during your sabbatical. It's in French, but I'm sure there's many listeners who are capable of the language. Do you want to maybe say a few sentences around the conversation? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I think, you know, in general, communication uh, is makes us somehow humans. Uh, journalism is very important. I mean, I, I, and I, I am. I have this idea. I just wanted to have make an experiment. Uh, you know, my own experiments with 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 uh, interviewing colleagues, as you are doing, here, mm. <laughs> yeah, Joe. So um, and um, the format I use were you know, like ten minutes uh, podcasts, uh, interviews of my the the people that I've been interacting with in, in Morocco, in Fez, and, and in Kinshasa, and it was really a fun experience because well, you know. That's not only the, the the ten minutes that you are spending with, with, with the colleagues, but you have to think about the thing ahead. So pre-production, production, production then recording, and, and then post-production. And, and there was helped by my my friend uh, Patricia, who uh, uh, worked with me on, on that. Mm. Uh, it was fun, and um, I don't know, uh, maybe I'll start again one day. Yeah, it's also something that I discovered for myself, maybe also due to your influence, um, that the podcast format is really, like, I wouldn't have expected it to be so much fun, also so much work, as you mentioned, <laughs> but, yes. like, the pre and post production, but, but it's a very engaging way to communicate about research affairs. Yes, yes, yes. Any yes. direction that's important to us, that we want to talk about, and let others participate, and also invite to the conversation, so whoever felt inspired or or heard by whatever we said here be free to reach out and yeah keep the conversation going thank you yes. so much for joining Ug, and it's always thank a you. pleasure to connect yeah 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 good luck with your product i'm you know admire you thank bye you bye. <laughs> yeah likewise yeah see you soon bye see you <laughs>